New Media Comedy Worldwide Studios. Studios. New, New Media, Media Comedy, Comedy Worldwide, Worldwide presents, presents Comedy, Comedy Legacy, Legacy Series, Series with, with Jim Mandrinos. And now your host, Jim Mandrinos. Hello everybody, welcome to Comedy, Comedy Legacy, Legacy Series. Series. I'm, I'm your host, Jim Mandrinos, and, and today, today is episode is monumental for me. Um, the gentleman I'm going to interview is probably the person I met in stand who I respect the most. Um, he's got a very similar philosophy to what I have in, in terms of comedy as an art form. Uh, and I really have enjoyed all the times I've spoken with him. And he has been gracious with his time talking to young performers. Uh, and he graciously agreed to come in and talk to us today. I also got to be honest, um, these interviews are inspired by his book, Comic Insights. And Franklin Ajay is living right now uh, in Melbourne, Australia. So we're probably going to have a lot of tech technical issues uh, during the course of this podcast. But here's what you will understand, that during the course of this episode, you will learn more than you can ever possibly imagine. This is a very special episode of the Comedy Legacy series. Please help me welcome our guest, Mr. Franklin and John. All right, so this is going to be a great podcast for me, at least, because I get to fanboy out. It's not often I get to talk to somebody that, before I even started stand-up, I would just turn on The Tonight Show. I would turn on, you know, The Midnight Special, a rock concert, and he would be there. And he's one of the people that um, influenced me as an artist, which is why I wanted to talk to him. And he's one of the people that, if you don't know him, you really need to know him. Uh, our guest today is Mr. Franklin Najai. Franklin, thank you so much for joining us. And you're joining us all the way from Australia in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, it's actually tomorrow as I'm talking to you. This is- uh, This is right here. Yeah, this is technology at its finest right now. Uh, and yeah, this is, is, yeah, and this is, uh, could you have imagined it? Because you started stand up in 70, I want to say 72. 72, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Could you have imagined this level of change in technology and the easy access of audience to the artist? Not, no, no, of course not. Because I, you know, I, I, I didn't even watch the Jetsons. So, <laughs> <laughs> I could, no, I didn't have any type of imagination about the future. I was obsessed with the present, trying to just figure out my life, really, if you want to know the truth. And I've never been a technologically oriented person, even with all the technology I I'm not a first adopter of anything, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, we're, we're all that way. I think, I think as artists, we want to explore what's happening here and now. And you've done so much of that. So much of your stand-up has been socially conscious over the years, and, but also deeply personal, like you're speaking your truth. Did you make philosophical decisions when you started on what you were going to write, or were you just writing what came naturally to you? Well... I think I did make a kind of a philosophical decision about what type of comedian I wanted to be because I knew that I was influenced by George Carlin and, and Klein prior, you know, for, uh, in the steps, you know, because when I was studying for 71, 70, quickly, George Carlin came out with his beard, you know, on the Tonight Show for the first time after I, I had seen him previously when he used to be clean shaven, you know, and he used to be Ed Sullivan and stuff like that, and the change and his material caught the spirit. I was into folk singers very strongly. I was into the, the, the music of uh, Motown, which was talking about things and change. So I knew that what I wanted to do with my comedy, and Gil Scott Heron in particular, mm -hmm. was a big influence on me because he was the same age. I remember being in law school, you know, about to, and he came out and um, I read up on him and I thought, well, he's 23, which is the same age as me. He's trying to, he's really bright. He's talking about the world and America at that time, you know, with the, with the television, tele, the, the revolution will not be televised. So right then I said, I'm gonna try to do comedy like them. So I knew what I wanted to do early, which was, I was in the zeitgeist of the times. I was a bit of a rebel. I was socially conscious about civil rights, society. It was all there. It was a good time 
to be a thinking comedian because everybody was thinking, the music was thinking, the, the comedy was thinking, you know what I mean, about society. So, yes, I made a decision then that it wasn't about laughs for me. It was really about uh, talking about the world as I saw it. Also, you know, I was drawn to uh, Carlin and Klein and Pryor and some of the guys earlier, you know, Woody Allen, uh, I read up on Lenny Bruce, certainly. You know, um, Jonathan Winters, I just went crazy about Jonathan Winters. The whole idea was cleverness to me. It was not really about era before, which was Boris Felt. Oh, this is my internet. Can you hear me still? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. You faded out for a second, Franklin, but, but since you faded out, do me a favor. Just take your laptop and point it down just slightly so I get more of your body in it. Oh, okay. Maybe, or maybe I can bring you. Oh, okay. Point it down more. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. There you go. And that'll All keep right. more of you in, in frame. And, and we'll, better. yeah, everyone understands that this is being recorded with uh, the technology, and sometimes the technology doesn't behave. Sure. But sure. you were talking particularly about, um, you know, uh, being influenced by Gil Scott here and, and Revolution Will Not Be Televised and bringing a lot of that in, which strikes me because I was listening to your albums again in preparation for listening to this and what I love most about what you do that no other comic from your generation was doing was the embracing of the silence in mm. what you were doing in, in in taking those pregnant pauses in letting a moment sink in which is fearless for a comedian and I don't think a lot of comedians understand that the opposite of laughter isn't silence that the opposite of laughter is applause was that something the opposite of laughter is chatter. You know, when they're talking, that's where you lose them. Well, you know, you know. Once again, I uh, I was influenced by comedians that use silence mm -hmm. as well. And if you're into music, and I was into Miles Davis, very heavy. And I remember reading that you have to use silence as a creative entity, a space. He called it space. You know. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I did, you know, a lot of young comedians start while the laughter's still going. In fact, Joan Rivers did that. I was watching something with Joan Rivers and she'd get a laugh and she'd be right back into her next joke. And I always felt like, uh, in particular with my material, it needed to sink in a little bit because I was really trying to make, make you know, a clever point or something, a connection. And I could hear people laughing at different, you know, somebody would re laugh right away. Some people would laugh a little slower. You can hear you know, the difference in the laughter when people pick up on it, you know? So I would always listen for that because I was, I, you know, I, I knew I wasn't telling punchline jokes. I wasn't telling punchline jokes. I was kind of doing routines. The comedians that I, I like use faith and I just believe I'll wait and let the laughter sink in before I start in again, you know what I mean? So that was just my approach at the time. And you no, know, I wasn't thinking it was distinctive at all, you know? It turned out to be very distinctive. I mean, that's one of the, the hallmarks of what you do. It, it's always seemed to me that what you did was closer to what Nichols and May were doing than hmm. what your typical stand-ups were doing in, in terms of painting v beautiful visual pictures, the amount of details that's in what you're talking about. You know, these, these are some things that I think are to a certain degree missing from modern comedy. Uh, well, where we... I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm mm -hmm. saying some some of the detail work that you put in there, um, painting pictures with words, taking those moments of silence, um, and even when you look at some of the early, you know, uh, midnight specials uh, shots that you did in Don Kirsch's rock concert shots that are available online, uh, you, you see, you know, little things like, you know, the, the physicality of how you're, you know, embodying the jokes. How much of that is written and how much of that develops naturally as you were performing? A lot of that came from, look, I was a real student. I was thinking about this. I, when I decided to be a comedian, I was in such a desperate state where I said, I have to make this work. I have no other way to live. You know, I, I was flunking out of law school. I didn't want to go back to college, you know, to try to get a graduate degree. So I had a, a BA in history, which meant what? It meant really nothing unless I go on and get a graduate degree. I didn't want to teach. 
and I didn't want to work a nine to five job. So it's like, I'm going to try that I could see to make a living. So I really became very analytical, you know? And I think another thing that uh, helped during that time was that was the era of the comedy record, okay? So when you really did listen to comedy, you were listening to great people who were painting pictures. And the key is in anything, whether you're writing a story or uh, doing comedy, is to see it, you know? Uh, you've got them, okay? And that's the key thing. I always would tell people, you know, it's not about the joke, you know, and it depends on your comedy, because I wasn't really into joke jokes. So I was, you know what I mean? And that was, I felt it was really important that I learned audio, through audio and listening to comedy more than visual. Not today, there's YouTube of everybody, right? Mm -hmm. But, and, and you can learn from that, and, I, and you should watch that and study it. But I really always tell people, hey, listen to a CD first, you know what I mean? and see how they get how they get you laughing and you're not and you're not watching them because they've got your mind visualizing what they're talking about so that is very important i don't know i don't watch a lot of i think that Chappelle does it very well um mm -hmm. i think i saw bill burr's special recently and he does it very very well you know what i mean he uh, gets he gets you into i think getting up getting drawing a picture for your public's mind is is paramount it's it's the key i think and i work on that all the time i used to work on that all the time you know is this because i'm seeing it in my mind part of it was i'm seeing i'm seeing it myself when, when i have a memory that when i was doing routine or talking about something i would be seeing it, you see so i would actually be communicating what i'm seeing to them because i'm seeing it very vividly okay and if i can see it then I can make them see it, you know? And that's really the key. I learned when I was over here, for example, I think I really grew as a comedian over here, but I had to make Australians aware of things that were distinctly American and make it understandable to them to get the laughs. Like Jack LaLanne was an example of a routine. Jack LaLanne was unheard of over here. And I had a great Jack LaLanne routine in America. Everybody knew him and I could make fun of it, right? So, but, so I had, right? So I could just describe what he did. And by the time yeah, I yeah, could get I to the punchline, for example, with the audience would have a, already know in their mind what he's like. So they could follow onto the punchline. So I feel like I learned really uh, well how to paint a picture in people's minds about things that they don't, they aren't aware of. And when I would talk about something happening in Africa, which obviously most people may not, or Zaire, which most people would not be aware of, I could paint a picture in their mind of what had struck me as odd and get the laugh. And so I really felt that was major for my growth as a comedian, because I didn't know I could do that till I had to do that, you see. Now, let's um, just talk a little bit, and, and we have some glitches, so this is gonna be cobbled together because we got some That's sound okay. glitches, so just letting you know. Um, we, we've got, you're a distinct line. Uh, the last two out of your albums, I believe you recorded in Australia. And those had more of a through line. Um, and those were much more musical and oh, yeah. much more patient than the stuff that uh, you were doing early, you know, with, with I'm a Comedian yeah. Seriously and mm -hmm. uh, Comedian Frankly the Jai. It, did you find, I think, I think the most direct way for me to ask the question was it was just, was it confidence in yourself that allowed you to take your time in those later ones? Or was it the, the audience in, in other parts of the world are just not as trained as the American audience for a joke every three seconds? No, I, look, even when I, when I was in the United States and I had that style, my style, look, the, the more I did it, the better I became, generally speaking. You know, I could, I could relax. I mean, the first five years I was a comedian, I didn't relax. I was nervous. And that shows, you know, you, you talk a little faster, you know, uh, by the time I think I did um, Don't Smoke Dope, Fly Your Hair, I was better, much better, you know, and uh, at storytelling and, and, and stuff, number one, you know. And then over time, just the thousands of thousands of performances, the times when you walk out and you're tired, you know, and you don't feel like going on. And 
and and just the relaxation of you know I can do this, I can do this show now. I I know what I'm doing. I wanted to always kind of have that kind of slower feel, which got me in trouble with television people in the United States. It, it was an obstacle that I I had to face all the time from the TV people. But you know, um, there's a there's a routine on my YouTube page about religion, which I did for the for the uh, funny spot, which was uh, posted by Chris Rock's brother Tony. Okay, mm -hmm. and I was television performance. It was like my last one actually. It seemed to catch capture me at where I was now. You know what I mean? As a comedian, just relax, knowing what I'm talking about knowing you know that the laugh is going to come knowing how to get out of it if the laugh doesn't come and there's a lot of way things that you learn over time that enable you to slow down um, you know and also to realize hey i don't want to i don't want to rush you know i want to come out and make it conversational for me the key was and i wrote this down very early when i was a comedian i wanted to be conversational i wanted to be i'm talking to the audience not not at the audience. I'm talking to them, you know, and that was always paramount. So I'm, you know, so you hesitate. You know, I had a good, I had a good friend named Gary. He was a natural comedian, and lives in San Jose. And he was a cat that could have been a comedian. He was natural. He was a great storyteller. He used to laugh at all of his stories, which was one of the things that made me realize I could laugh, telling my stories as well, because I went, God, I really enjoyed. You know, I'd go hang out with him in San Jose when I finish a gig and. San Francisco, maybe hang out with him for about three or four days, listen to all these crazy stories about women. It'd be very funny, and I and he'd be laughing as he would tell them, and I'd be laughing at him laughing as him telling it. And I went, this works. And I remember thinking, that'll work on stage for me. I can laugh, you know, while I tell it, because if you're with your friends, you do, and your friend laughs when he tells it. So I felt like that's not going to be an obstacle. And really, there are no rules at all when you're a stand-up. I mean, which is, Lewis brings up his sheet of papers, or he used to, right? right? There's no rules. If you're getting the laughs, you can laugh at it, or you can be not laugh. So I just think that over time, I just became more me, you know, just more me in the story. I think Chappelle does that really well. I, I watched his specials. Uh, he's just really just talking to the audience and, and taking his time, you know. Um, yeah, he's. I think he's really the one of the best at doing that. Now, yeah. you know yeah now do you think uh you said that you you want to have a conversation with the audience which is something i've always strived to and when i teach stand-up i always teach them that it's not a monologue it's a conversation that they're they're part of the conversation is to laugh but it's still a conversation inherent in that for me is also listening how much did the way the audience laughed how they laughed and what they laughed at influenced how you would structure a set from night to night well, first off, after a while, you know, I would change my sets up every, you know, I'll give you an example of something like, say I was doing a show here at this comedy festival, and I, I mean, like, say like the first comedy festival I did here in 1997. I hadn't done stand-up in three years. So I got out all my notes, and I put together a set, an hour set, the stuff I'd done, looking at it, refilling familiarizing myself with it. So the first week I did that set kind of A to Z, you know, start one. At the end of the first week, my set anyway. And listening to the audience, I think, is important. You, you, you need to, to hear laughter, but also it's the type of laughter and also the type of silence. There's bored silence, and there's an interested silence. And you should be able to tell the difference, you know? Where there's some, where you know that they're, they're hanging on your every word when they're being silent. You can feel that, I can feel that. Then there's bored silence, but I haven't had that since early days when they used to be bored, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, <laughs> cause I wasn't being funny. So, <laughs> so, so I can, I, you know, I, I, for me, the key was, and then by, and back to my point, by the end of that six weeks, I had 45 minutes of new material because 
when I feel comfortable with my show to where I can enter at a different spot and end it at different spots, you know, I can, well, I'm here, I can build the rest to this ending, or I'm here and I can build the rest to this ending, or I'll save this ending, but I can get to it even if I go around the, the mountain, I can get to that one, you know, <laughs> you know, the end. I can, it also means I can go down digression, which is the key to writing on stage mm -hmm. for me. You know, I got to where I could write on stage. I could go down a digression. I might, instead of playing it safe, when I was say, the first week, I, I didn't digress. I just did it so I could get familiar. The next week, I could start to, if I have a thought off of a laugh, that might spur something in my mind because it's, in, <clears throat> it's all inside of you. You don't know what's inside of you, you know, until you mm -hmm. kind of say it. But there's so much in your subconscious that you don't know is in there until maybe you go down a lot or you something pops out, some ad lib pops out and you start to follow that. Once I could go down digressions, I could build new material without being a fright. In other words, I could say, well, I don't know which way this road is going, but it's, but I know if, if there's nothing down there, I know how to get back to this other road. You know, if I have, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can get back. You know, because it's like being, a, you know, out there in the West. Well, you know, I'm going to go down, but I think I can get back to the main trail if I, it doesn't go. And that gives you confidence to actually explore. Now, with, uh, with all of that and, and, and all the writing you do on stage, what was your process when you were there? And I'm, I'm just uh, in the middle of a freeze here, so I'm going to keep babbling until it pops out. Ah, oh, you're yeah. back. Um, what is oh. your process? <laughs> we're we're going to deal with a lot of technical stuff today, Franklin. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I was just, can you hear me now? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Go for it. And, and you froze again. We're going to wait this one out too. Just give it a second. Because I swear to God, I'm getting this interview done, Franklin. You're too important for them not to hear. Oh, just a second. Oh, you got an idea? Oh, yeah, my, my internet went off for a second. Ah, there you go. You're back. All right. Yeah. So I'm sorry. Let's, uh, let's show this. What, is, you what is the last thing you, you heard me talking about? Uh, I heard you talking about being able to get off the road and going down on, okay. on tangents. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I yeah. want to ask this because that's writing on stage. How much of a foundation do you have to have the material you've written prior to getting on stage before you feel comfortable playing on stage? Can you go totally new on stage or is that something that you oh, want to? <clears throat> well, I used to write out what I, my, my writing process and I was looking through a lot of my notebooks the other day. I used to really write my routines out initially more in detail, you know, um, outline them, know what I, you know, I used to, but over time, once again, over time, I was always oriented to trying to write on stage because that was one of the appeals of Lenny Bruce. You know, when I read everything about Lenny Bruce, it was how he would uh, make up and change things with that jazz kind of style. I was drawn to jazz musicians, so I was bored quickly. That was one of the things I, I'd get very bored quickly. I couldn't just be one of those comedians that could just uh, do the show A through Z like many do. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I just get too bored. So I always knew that the goal was to get to where I could be comfortable enough to do that. Smoking a joint helped a lot. You know, I would I would smoke a joint. That helped a lot because that would give me sometimes that would allow me to be brave enough to take a digression. Whereas if I was kind of straight, I might say, well, I don't know what's down that road. But if I was had a little bit of a buzz on it, I'd say, well, you know, let's see what's down that road and have enough confidence that, you know, I could find something. Carlin calls it. He had confidence in being able to find the comic distortion later in his career. I always remember that. He said, later on, I could know a subject, hit a subject and realize, I think I can find the comic distortion. You know what I mean? He had enough confidence. And that's how I would feel. It's like, I don't know what's down that road, but something's drawing me there. Uh, and I'd surprise myself. And that was really the fun. I mean, and even if it didn't work, I would all of a sudden realize, you know what? I can make that work tomorrow. You know what I mean? I realized why it didn't work. But now I know I, how I can work, make it work tomorrow because I didn't make it work this time, but now I, I know why. You know what I mean? Because I take my show and I see, oh, that's why 
you know. So that's how I would actually create a lot of material. The much later in my career, I just jot down an idea. I would, you know, I wouldn't really write it out anymore. You know what I mean? I would just jot it down and know, you know, just the highlights of no, I got something here, you know, and I know I can. Uh, what's what I what's what's not what struck me funny, but what struck me odd. Not so much as what struck me as funny about this that that I would comment on. It's what struck me as odd. You know what I mean? I'll give an example. It's the 1993 uh, World Trade Center when the guys um, blew up with the bomb, the, the truck bomb. Yeah. And they were caught the next day, or uh, because they took the, the tried to get the refund back for the truck. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> And that was the only way they got caught. So I, so I built a whole routine based on Frugal Jihad. The name of their group was Frugal Jihad. You know what I mean? Because that's all I thought. All I had is, I said, they, they had to get this 200 and it was $200. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that struck me as odd. That little detail struck, no, nobody else commented on it. You see? Yeah. And I, and, but that little detail struck me not as funny, but odd. Now that's odd. That's the only way they got caught. They were scot free. You know what I mean? How cheap do you have to be <laughs> to do that, right? So I built a whole routine called Frugal Jihad about it. We did a meeting where they're meeting and they're, they're doing all of the detail work and saying, don't forget to get the receipt when you get the truck, you know, and stuff like and sign your real name, you know. And I just off that little detail, you see, just that oddity spurred me. And I went, okay, there's something there. It's you know what I'm talking because I. I remember you came in, you were kind enough to come into uh, New York City and do the Underground Comedy Festival. Uh, That's still going on? Do you guys still have it? We we relaunched it during the pandemic to give the comics a sense of community and hope. We had stopped for a number of years, but uh, we did it just to kind of get everyone spirits up, and it really worked. And we, we raised some good money for charities uh, as well, so we were able to do some good. Um, hopefully, we'll keep it going. I think it's time to keep it going. Uh, but when you came and you talked to them, uh, I remember um, a gentleman asked you if you still loved writing jokes. And I have never seen a human being smile as big as you did when he asked that question, because you talked about how much you loved writing and how much you loved creating um, to a group of brand spanking new comics that had come for an afternoon workshop. and. It just amazed me because at that point, I think you'd been doing this, it had to be over 30 years, uh, well over 30 years at that point. Uh, and you you still had a joy of performing and creating. You know, it, what is it about writing that's always been fun for you? Well, that's interesting. You know, I, I, I never really, I actually never, no, no, I won't. I never, I was a reluctant comedian for many years. I mean, I, 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 I never really was uh, into the fame aspect. You know, I never pursued it. I wanted to be a really good comedian, but fame was not what I wanted. I actually, I actually feared fame, to be honest, which is why I went into television writing for a long time to get away, to lower my profile, to get away from the idea of being famous. You know, I, I just didn't want to be, you know, recognize I wanted to do something in the field but not really have my daily life uh, um, interrupted you know because I feel the joy of, of life is really doing the daily stuff for me for me you know what I mean and I've hung out with some people who were big stars and I saw the interruption you know I for me I don't know if I had the joy of writing because I really wasn't writing you know I've had more joy writing recently because I'm trying to write a story and I've actually felt that, even though uh, it's been, uh, I've been having trouble. But for me, I, you know, come age and surprising myself was joyous for me. If I, when I, when I, because that's why I would laugh. You know, my laughs on, 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 in my shows, not so much in TV, because I always had to, I only had five minutes and stuff in a club or whatever, where I just laugh, or you hear me on the albums just laughing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. or, or if that, even in that um, religion YouTube thing, you just see me break down laughing, even though I'm on TV, I, something I said, because I, I had lived some of that that night. 
about the, the, the welcome to hell orientation meeting. And I didn't have that plan. But that's how comfortable I felt, you know, going off a transition about being sent to hell to create the welcome to hell orientation meeting. And I ended up laughing for about 10 seconds right there, stopping, because I had really surprised myself, you know, and the audience has totally surprised and they laughed at the whole concept. So right away, the laughter spurs you also to more creativity. The laughter kind of helps you, you know, go down the road. You know, I find, you know, so that's really the pleasure. That was the pleasure for me was surprising myself with something in my subconscious that I didn't know was there coming up. Right. That was it. Now, you uh, mentioned you wrote a lot for TV and you've written uh, on a lot of really good shows, too. But you've also acted in films and, and on television. You've also, um, uh, last year, you, you reprised your role on uh, Deadwood. You yep. know, um, you've done all these things in show business. Is there like a hierarchy? Is there what you love the most? And then, well, you know, I'll be honest. It's funny. I think I've, I've written for television. I've been a stand-up comedian. I've been, a, I've been, a, I've written for television. I've been a stand-up comedian. I've acted. Acting, I enjoy the most because it's the le the least pressure, and it's camaraderie. I okay. enjoy, I enjoy. Uh, splitting the responsibilities for making a scene work. I enjoy that, you know, and I enjoy that you can, if it doesn't work, you can do it again. You know, and like when I did Deadwood, it's, you know, I, I think that the thing that I was best at, I thought about this, I was a good television writer. I think that realistically, I was a great stand-up comedian, you know, but, and I was a good actor. You know, I'm a very good actor. When I look at the things that I do, how do I, I said, I think I came closest to mastering stand-up. Okay, I was a good television writer, but not an exceptional television writer, you know, looking at my, for acting, I, I became a very good, very, very solid, very strong technique actor, you know, and I, you know, and Deadwood in particular is a, is a test of that. You really got to be on your game to be in Deadwood and Deadwood kind of validated me as an actor. I, I felt like I'm with you the best, doing the best right work and I'm hanging in there, you know, and it also made me strive more you know I, I like I've got to come up to this level so that was like something that I wanted to do so I enjoy uh, I don't miss any of it at all you know, but uh, you know it's not it's not like I want to do it and even when I did dead with the movie I said I'm glad this is the end I you know I, I'm I, this is it for me I don't miss these early mornings on the set you know at six in the morning I had a three o'clock wake up time when a.m. I went no no this is not something I want to do anymore, <laughs> you know. So, uh, but I enjoy the camaraderie. And when you're doing scenes with people, good actors, the creativity together, and the fact that, uh, so I feel that I enjoy that the most of the three that I did. Mm -hmm. In television, I didn't get to write on the shows I would, would have liked to write on, the really smart shows, you know, which only a few writers got to write on. You know, I wrote on more average uh, shows except for uh yeah most the sitcoms are okay. uh you were saying that you didn't really get to write on the smart shows that you wanted to no. it? yeah you know so every i mean everybody in hollywood knows the shows you want to write on just like everybody in hollywood knows the shows you want to act on i wanted to act on a really top-notch show you know because i've acted a lot on average shows and that's okay working on deadwood like i i you know you're working on you're working in movies and you're working i was in Car Wash, which was a hit movie, but I did a lot of movies which weren't really, you know, hits. Just you know, just working like a working actor. I do a lot of TV shows, a few of them, and they're just good shows. Nobody remembers them. When I got the chance to work on Deadwood, I went, well, this is it. This is like, okay, I'm on, on top of the line. And like that's what I'm saying. Every right actor knows the show. And you know how you know when I would go into casting uh, calls for other shows every actor would have, be watching Deadwood. If you go into the casting room and the actors are all there, it's a show watched by actors. And that's when you really know you're in something because the actors really watch. They always watch the really good shows because everyone wants to try to be on one and say, I wish if I could be on one like that and test myself, if nothing else. Am I good enough to be with them? You know what I mean? Is the yeah. question. You know, so 
you know, so I remember when I got when I got on Deadwood, I was so nervous. I was so nervous the first time because they say, be careful what you wish for, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know, you want to be on a show like this, are you good enough? Especially when you see that they kill people off every week. You know, yeah. you know. And so I used to say my goal is to make sure I live. I'm gonna act my ass off so I live. <laughs> <laughs> and and you did. You most certainly did. I lived the whole time, Jack. You know yep. what I mean? <laughs> now, um, that's the show that I think you're most proud of or the role you're most proud of. Um, to my generation, it's it's car wash. Seeing all the comics oh, okay. that were in car wash and, and being there, that's iconic comics of my generation. But not only do you have that, you also then, uh, many years later, were uh, the dad in Bridesmaid. And, right. and when, I tell, <laughs> when I told some comics I was interviewing you, they were like, Meet the dad from Bridesmaid? Like, you have a whole new generation of people that are familiar with you from that. That's such a small part, though. That's a, that, that was a huge, you know how to, you know, you know how you know you're in a hit? Because I just, you know, I did it. I think I worked a week. You know what I mean? A mm -hmm. week. Didn't think any, I didn't think anything about it. You know, a week. Then the movie comes out. And all of a sudden, I'm getting recognized everywhere I go for, you know, and it was of all races and ages, which was rare because with car wash, mostly black people recognized me. Mm -hmm. Think Deadwood, mostly white people recognized me. Not many black people were watching Deadwood. Bridesmaid, every race, every age. I'll give you an example. I had a Korean woman that I used to take my laundry to for 20 years. All she would say, how much starch? When you want. That's all she said every time for 20 years, right? <laughs> <laughs> I walked in one day. Yeah, she's nice. I'm she's a good guy. And she came up to me and she said, were you in Bridesmaid? And I went, now that's a hit. Because this woman. <laughs> it inspired her to learn another sentence. I mean, yeah. If she thought bride, I mean, I would have never even thought she was a demo that would go to see Bridesmaid. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? I went, well, that's a hit. So for about two months, I was recognized everywhere, then it dropped off. Okay, but that's when you realize, wow, this is a this is a huge hit, because this type of recognition for a small part, you know, and it and it crossed every demographic, you know, every race, yeah. every age is amazing. Now and, you you also wrote on something that's iconic in the county community, which is in Living Color, um, yes. and I, is that where you met? Because um, you and I have a, a mutual friend in common, Barry Barry. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Barry's. Uh, I know he's your a writing partner on a lot of stuff. And for me, Barry was the first comic that pulled me aside at the comic strip in New York and went, "You're not writing correctly. Let me show you." And he mm. actually sat down with a pad and pen and showed mm -hmm. me how to fix a couple of jokes. So, uh, you know, what was that experience like? And did you know when you were writing it that that show was going to turn out to be that iconic? off i got fired from the show you know what I mean? <laughs> every writer gets fired from whatever show they're hired for Barry and i got fired uh it was very grueling it was very grueling at the time because kian was real it was a real that's how barry and i ended up writing together because Keenan set this thing up I, I want five new ideas every day you know and we had a staff and that's crazy he is every day and you, 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 after a while, we're, you're having problems with that. So Barry, you know, we got, we, we hit it off. I met Barry. And um, one day he said, look, you know, like, would you like to write together as a, as a partner? He said, I'm tired of writing alone. And I said, yeah, because I thought together we could come up with more ideas, mm -hmm. which we were together, you know, sitting in together, bouncing stuff off. I always advise when I talk television writing, I say, get a, get a partner if you can. You know what I mean? If you can find someone you can get along with, right, you know, uh, it, it's just going to help you, you know, because I, I learned that with Gary. We, we were much more productive together than we were separately, and we wrote better together than we each wrote separately for the show, you know, mm -hmm. and for scripts subsequently. So that's how, but it was grueling because the demand for five new ideas every day. I mean, it was just... You hated the pitch meeting when you had to go in and pitch, you know, be, I mean, because you, you couldn't come up with five 
two new ideas every every day. And you get get that was the he was a very tough boss. Keenan. He got tougher after so we 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 got written out. A lot of writers kind of got written out. And by that I mean we just didn't have any more, so we changed the staff because we were written out. And that's why I got fired because we really didn't have any more ideas, you know, when you beat them at that pace. But it was grueling. It did hit pretty quickly. That surprises because you can't predict, you know, anything like that. I think people were waiting for it. You know, you never know what people are missing till it's till it's put in front of you. And and obviously, in Living Color, hit that chord. You know, for black sketch show that was really un, unheard of. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There weren't many sketch shows. Uh, in a while, you know, I was brought up on Carol Burnett, which was a great sketch show, you know, yeah. and um, there weren't many subsequently till Living Color popped up, really. So, no, we didn't know it was going to be a hit. We were gratified. It launched, it helped me and Barry get more writing uh, gigs together. Coming off of uh, Living Color, it kind of launched our writing career in television, mm -hmm. you no, know, certainly. So, that was a springboard for us because being cut like that wasn't really being fired it was like the whole staff was pretty much written out and you yeah. see a lot of shows do that change staffs at the end of the season because they're kind of written out you know what i mean and i was certainly you know yeah now you um you taught television writing uh, as well and uh you've also got what in my opinion is the single most iconic book on the art of stand-up comedy um, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how you came up with the idea to put your book together because literally whenever somebody says, I want to learn stand up, what do I need to do? First thing I do say is you need to go online and you need to buy this book. So let's talk about what made you put the book together, Comic and say it's I'm going to I'm gonna stay right there. I'm going to get something off my bookshelf and show you something. All right. I'm All right. See it. Yep. I'm here. Can you see? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Let me see it. You freeze it up, but Milton Berle, Shug German, Jack Benny, Joey Bishop. Yeah, oh, yeah. you back on, Franklin. I thought the war would come. <laughs> in, in, in New York right now, it might. So this book I bought, let me see when it was written. It was uh, 1973. Uh-huh. And the comedians, Woody Allen, it's a book of interviews. Woody Allen, Milton Berle. Shelly Berman. Phyllis Diller's interview, by the way, helped me enormously. And Woody Allen's interview helped me enormously. And so when I when I I I read all of the interviews, this book helped me more than the other comedy books that were out at the time. You know, and so when it came time for me to write my book, I went, I want to do something uh, that for this generation of younger comedians. I felt like you, I didn't think they were taking it as seriously as my generation had taken it. You know what I mean? They were coming in more for, I don't know, to be a television star, using a stand-up as a springboard yeah. rather than wanting to be one, you know? And I went, well, let me, and that's really the thought. Of I said, well, maybe, I, maybe if I point the way for them to see how serious maybe they need to take it, it'll help them. So I, so I had a template. I went, I had a template mm -hmm. and I went, well, I know the type of book that helped me the most. And I also knew that I could ask really good questions. That I knew that the problem for most comedian, young comedians, even myself, when I started, was you don't know what to ask. You know, you ask a general question, how do you get your material? I remember I asked Robert Klein. I went to the Troubadour, watched him. Boy, he was really good. 1972, I saw him at the Troubadour. Top form, man. Just really had that. He had Child of the, uh, no. Child of the had, 50s uh, and Mind Over No, Matter. not that one. Uh, the water, the, uh, Mind Over Matter. Yep. I asked him, how do you keep from being bored? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And he told me, well, you're going to have to do these routines sometimes 15, 2,000 times. That's just the job. Okay. So I thought, well, I can ask questions of these comedians that, com that aspiring comedians won't be able to think of. Because I've been through it all by trial and error, and I can help the question, answer the questions, ask the questions, pardon me, that would help 
young comedians. I knew it. And I said, I'll ask the questions so that of the things they need to know. And, and that was really, first off, I, I found it interesting to learn how these other comedians worked as well, because I didn't know the details of their process. You know what I mean? So for me, it was like an opportunity to say, well, you know, I like these guys. And I picked the ones I respected, you know, so yeah. I had a personal kind of thing. I said, who, who do I like? You know, I picked three women because I said, I want to get, get three women in there that are good and different, you know, I want to get different styles of comedians from social commentary to someone like Sinbad or, or Jerry, who just likes to do more general entertainment comedy. You know what I mean? Uh, so I wanted to get a, a range because I went like, you know, let everybody relate to who they relate to. And, and that was really what I, drew, I said, I want to write a book like uh, I would like to have had when I was starting out. And The Great Comedians was that book for me. And so it's a modern day version uh, you know of it that's that was really it that's what i based it on plus my own story which i you know which i put my own so my, i just had it for interviews and i sent to my agent my agent said put your own story in there at the beginning because i hadn't i didn't have that in at the beginning oh, and, and so to me, I, that's what puts it together that's yeah i so context. i said oh okay because i just thought a book of great interviews like the first one was just a book of interviews that i great comedians he said no put your own story in it as well. So I went, okay, I'll think about it. Tell my story, show, you know, went through my notebooks. And uh, it, it, I think it did help the book. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, for me, it gave context because when you were asking questions, you know, based off your explanation of your own process, I got, you know, points you were looking for confirmation and I got points where you were digging deeply because you wanted to, to get there you know, uh, insight. So it, it really, for a reader, um, that chapter is probably more important than almost any other chapter in there. And there's a ton uh, of, of great stuff in there. And, and, you know, the wildly different processes that you were showing uh, of somebody like a Carlin versus somebody like a Seinfeld versus, you know, some of the other guys that were in there, it really, did it amaze you that so many people had such different approaches to coming up with, with craft? Well, that's interesting. I mean, it didn't amaze me so much as, uh, I think, I mean, Jay doesn't write anything down. That amazed me. Yeah. You know, Jay Leno doesn't write anything down. I, I can always remember, I can remember, I got I can remember uh, each, each person's uh, kind of uh, approach seemed to fit them. So what I, I wasn't really that surprised. I mean, I knew Jerry was very disciplined. You know, I knew that Richard Lewis was very nice to um, hear the different processes and see how they differed from mine. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And also it, it made you realize everybody's an individual. That's why I, I don't like to always lump comedians. Or, you know, comedians are like this. I, I, I'm, you know, everybody's different. You know, just like, um, all right, you're back. You're back. You're back. You're saying yeah, how everyone's different. Yeah, everyone is that's, you know, everyone's an individual. And, you know, and that's what I, I liked about it. And it was interesting to see their influences. You know, looking back, it's been a long time since I've looked through the book. I remember a, certain lines came out at me. Uh, Paul Reiser's line. Sometimes the personal is the most universal. It's one of the most important things that I think I heard a comedian say that I, that I remember. Yeah. As a, as a real thing to read, uh, I went, wow, that's really true, you know, when he said that. Yeah. Uh, Louis, Louis Anderson saying, controversy creates work. It's something I always think about, you know, in these days and age. Yeah. In particular, you know, and I mean, he was right on the money. You, yeah. Even if you're Stormy Daniels, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you, you, your gigs She'll never gonna, be out of work. Yeah, your gigs are going to pick up, you know. So... Uh, that was something that jumped out of me. The comic distortion of uh, George Carlin saying, I, I've gotten to the point where I can see the comic distortion in the subject. Mm -hmm. I, I remember thinking, oh, that's uh, Jerry saying how he had to reward himself, put something by his place where he writes to make himself right. You know what I mean? Because we all, yeah. it's very hard to, uh, to make yourself do stuff like that. So, but I, I'm trying to, you know, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm really proud of the book. You know, I'm, I, you know, I didn't, 
it's sold all over the world. I mean, it's not huge, but uh, it's steady, and I think it holds up. Good, you know, and um, I think it's informative. Where you know you can learn. Any young comedian can read all of those people and learn from. You know, and watch. You know, you, you can watch. You can read them and then watch them on on YouTube, and it's got to help. You know, it it definitely does. Are you um? You said earlier in our interview that you did, you didn't really want to chase fame. That wasn't what was in it for you. But what you do have is you have a legacy. Because in talking to so many comics, when I ask who influenced you, you know, Leanne mentioned you, Wally Collins mentioned you, so many comics mention, oh, Franklin and Jai, Franklin and Jai. Are you surprised that your work uh, has stayed as prominent as it has, at, at least yeah. for the artists? Yeah, very surprised. I was very, because there's a long time, you know, I came up. Okay, yeah. you're back. <laughs> we are back. Okay. We yeah. are surprised. <laughs> yeah, I, I was very surprised because at the time I came up, Richard Pryor was at his peak. Carlin was at his peak. Pine was at his peak. So I was actually coming into that arena right at the time. So first, so first off, they were all three my idols. So I realized I'm right here, right there. I'm coming in. And certainly I felt I was overshadowed by them trying to, you know, get a foothold in, but making a little bit of a, uh, making a little bit of a mark. But then, you know, Richard was really, Richard, then Eddie, then Martin Lawrence, Eddie Griffin, all of them overshadowed me as black comedians. You know what I mean? When, uh, and so I actually felt, and they all seemed to really be influenced by Richard. Whereas I was influenced by Richard, but not as much as them. You know, because I, I was influenced as much by Klein and Carla. Mm -hmm. And so I felt, you know, when, when people thought about, you know, the black comedian, which is the idea of a, the black comedian being high energy, you know, be, uh, you know, very high energy, which I wasn't, you know. And everybody after, you know, Eddie was very high energy, uh, Eddie Griffin, uh, Martin, and so I felt like, well, well, I don't have that, and I can't do that, you know. And I felt like they surpassed me, had a lot more prominence, had a lot more influence, you know what I mean, on particularly young black comedians. I felt that I had no, I just, it's honest, I felt I had no influence whatsoever. Not that it bothered me, because I wasn't out there trying to influence anybody. You know, that wasn't the goal. I was trying to, I'm overshadowed, that's okay, I don't really have an impact. I was surprised when I came back from Australia in 2004 and talked to a lot of young black comedians that I that I had been noticed. That was the biggest surprise. And I did I did um, a special for BET for yep. yeah for BET. They asked me to do one. You know, so I just I so I did that thing a special for BET one hour special, which surprised me. Said, and um, all these young black comics came to see it and came back to talk to me. And that surprised me, very much so. I went, wow, I didn't, I didn't think you cats were paying attention to me at all because of you know, all these people I had named previously. I thought that's, those are the guys that had your attention. And they said, no, we, we've been watching. We, we really respect you, what you do. And I went, wow, OK, a very pleasant surprise. Recently, I found out that Kevin Hart plays uh, a lot of my material on his show, and that's that's uh, you know that's uh, created new fans. He plays me quite quite regularly. I hear. Yes, you know? he does. And so I, when I, I found out when I came back for Deadwood, somebody said, "You know how I found out? Look, I, I you know I'm on Sound Exchange, so I sent a lot of my material to the comedy networks on Sirius and whatever." So, and I was getting a little bit of money every now and then. And then all of a sudden I started getting a lot of money each month. And I went, what's going on? You know, just last year, about yeah, two years ago, all of a sudden each month I started getting a lot of royalties from sound exchange. And I said, what's going on? When I got to Deadwood, I said, and the guy said, well, you know, Kevin Hart plays you all the time. I said, really? And then we were driving in the car and I came on on Kevin Hart's show. So Kevin is being so popular. It's been like an indirect boon to me you know what i mean yeah where through kevin 
people have discovered me and my material is timeless. It doesn't really date. You know, that's something that I didn't, I wasn't do, planning on at the time, but I see it doesn't date. You know, it'll be funny forever because it does, it can't be dated, you know? Yep. So, so that's been, uh, so, you know, um, I think if you live long enough, you know, everybody, the key to becoming a legend is living long enough, is living long enough in a way, I think, you know, if you, you know. Yeah. <laughs> if you live, you know, if you live long enough, you know what I mean? I remember when I was in LA, a cat came and he said, man, you're a legend. I said, well, how come I can't get a job? You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm the unemployed legend, you know? <laughs> um, you know, you know. I want to talk about this because uh, I don't know if you'll remember this. We were standing at um, the Laugh Lounge when you were going to go up for the festival uh, when you came to New York. And we were talking about influences. And in particular, we were talking about jazz because you and I both have a love of jazz. And I tell comics this all the time. You can be influenced by more than just stand-up. You know, and yeah. you, were, you and I were having that conversation about how the musicality was part of what inspired you to work the way you work. For me, it was uh, the writers of the Beat Generation, you mm -hmm. know, reading Neil Cassidy or, or reading Jack Kerouac, and I try and structure my stand up or, Did around. Did you read On the Roof? Did you read On the Roof? On the Road? On the Road? I uh, love On the Road. Is it uh, it's good? not as good as Dharma Bums, but it's a good book. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's the famous one. Yeah, it is. But Dharma, if you're going to read one, if you haven't read one, read Dharma Bumps. That's the better one to read. But, you know, so for me, you know, those influences came in. How can comics use outside influences like music and great writing to, to further their experience as a stand-up? Well, I'll tell how I used it. You know, uh, you know I was in the music, look, I'm in the music period, you know, jazz in particular, but, you know, but also uh, the folk rock music of that era I love, you know, creative. I like uh, Gil Scott Heron, you know, Bill Withers, the, the Curtis Mayfield, the people who wrote kind of social commentary music. I was into French films. I was into Marlon Brando. I was into artistic things, period. And I feel that I looked at the art in every, you know, I, I looked at people that were artists. That's what drew me. And the thing for me was to look at all, all of the art forms and in my own mind, think, what can, I, what can I pull from this to put in my comedy in a way? I wanted to be an artist of stand-up comedy. That was very important to me, more important than anything. You know, I wanted to be, I, I wanted to be a great comedian, not in the sense of, oh, he's great because he's famous and making a lot of money or very, very popular, but when somebody say, oh, you know, he's a great comedian, he's, you know, whatever the skills were that I had identified as a comedian, whether it was like by looking at Pryor and his movement and his voices and, and uh, Klein and in, in, in his intelligent approach and, 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 and uh, Carlin with his uh, more provocative insights or Brando's acting. I looked at Brando. He was my, my favorite actor at that time, you know, with the, what was that film? Last Tango in Paris, Francois Truffaut. I used to watch a lot. Of, I just went, the whole, the whole spectrum of art, I just kind of absorbed it into me as a motivation of what I was going to try to do. Now, I don't know how I brought, you know, Brando or Francois Truffaut into my stand-up, other than it was part of the overall concept of trying to be honest and truthful. You know, Brando's acting was very honest, you know, and and Truffaut's films were very honest and truthful, uh, truthful about life. And then uh, people like Gil Scott was very intelligently, you know, challenging society, you know, in an intelligent fashion. So everything kind of, for me, in jazz music was, you know, improvis improvisational. You know, the, the, the idea that each show would be a little bit different and you would take an idea and explore it, you know, was important to me. That was probably the most important thing for me as a comedian. So I just think that if you look at all artists, you can make, you know, you can apply it to your, what you're trying to do if you are interested that way. I don't know if someone, I don't think it's mandatory 
you know, that you have to do that. I'm just saying that if you are of, of that mind, you can. You just look at all art. And you can absorb it and use it and bring it into your own approach. You know, are you still there? Because I can't see. You. I am still here and hanging on every word. This is uh, this is like my church for me. I'll be honest. You know. Oh, is, is Trump there in front with a Bible? <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's the good kind of church, not the bad kind of church. Let's. Uh, I, I I do also want to touch on this because one of the things I'm also you know, doing with, with this is I'm reaching out to people that genuinely love the art form like yourself, but also people that have have a record of community and, and the stand up community is small. But, you know, it, I, I, I look at it this way, I would not be here, I would not have had a 30 some odd year career, if it weren't for people like Barry Barry sitting me hmm. aside when I was 20 and telling me, no, you're writing wrong. Here's how you do it. Or somebody like, uh, I don't know if you remember Ronnie Shakes uh, from the uh, early 80s pull, pulling me aside and saying, hey, okay, you know, what are you doing? Let's get some physicality in it. Or even, you know, Sam Kennison kicking me in the butt and going, you know, you need to believe in the stuff you're talking about, you know. Yes. And, and I, I, I'm perched on their shoulders in terms of a career. Who are some of the people that helped you along the way? Some of the people that were, once you became a comedian, instrumental in helping you stay a comedian? Well, look, there's um, Robert, no, Bob Newhart. I was working in a clothing store in Century City in Los Angeles. And a woman came in. I was just uh, starting out being a comedian, going to the comedy store, thinking about it. And a woman came in and said, I want to buy a suit for my husband's birthday. I'm going to buy the suit. And tomorrow he'll come in and get it fitted. So I helped her. And when we came up to the to pay for the suit, she gave me her credit card and said, Mrs. Bob Newhart. So I said, wow. She said, yeah, he'll be in. So I, I thought, great, I'm working tomorrow. So he came in the next day. Very nice man. Just like the same kind of persona. You know what I mean? Low key. Mm -hmm. uh, on a, you know, no one even recognized it. To show you how, how low key he was. So, um, so, so, so basically, uh, he came in, and I asked him how did he write his material. And he said he outlined. He said I outline all my routine, you know, just like you outline. You know, you're taught to outline out what you want to say and make outline the points you want to make, you know. And I went great. So that was the first insight into how to maybe start writing routines. You know what I mean? That was very important. I hadn't been doing that previously. Uh, Klein, of course, telling me when I asked, because I didn't run into many people, but I think someone had helped me. David Brenner, I had done a hoot night, amateur night at the Troubadour, and I had done one before that had done really well. And I came to do another one, and I was terrible. I bombed. And I lost all my confidence at, right then. I bombed at the Troubadour, and I just went, oh my God, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. And I went to the comedy store and David Brenner was there one night. And I went up to talk to him and I said, you know, I, I don't know if I can write material anymore. I don't know what to do. You know what I mean? You know, I just bombed. He said, well, get away from it for a while. Just don't worry about it. Just get away from it for a while. You know what I mean? You can do it. And I did get away from it for a bit. You know what I mean? Because in those days, when I was young, I, I was kind of obsessed. You know, you're always looking for something funny. You know what I mean? And that's not good. You know, you, you can't be walking around like that. And I did. I kind of got away from it. And somehow I found a way to write some material again that was reflective of, you know, something I was doing with my friends. Because it was key for me to kind of do something that I might have created talking to my friends because I felt if I if it came out of me just talking to my friends that was my genuine sense of humor that was my best bet for being successful because that was actually funny and I always feel that that him helping me relax about it was very important because I really was panicked you know so I say he in particular had a lot of impact on me just that uh, you know, people in my life. 
can't really think of many, many more. Well, you know? one's enough. One can be more than enough, and, and you know, hopefully he knew how much he influenced you at that point. Let's. And the uh, funny thing, because he doesn't know this, is <laughs> this is funny. I watched him on a Tonight Show and thought, he's not that funny. I can be better than him. That's what made me actually decide to become a comedian. I didn't tell him that. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, he used to come on, he was on all the time, and I was watching him, and I'd say, you know, that's not that funny, I think I can be funnier than him, so it was him, seeing him, thinking, oh, I can be funnier, but yet, ironically, it was him who helped me, you know, get over a, a crisis, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah that, that, that is a funny story. <laughs> um, I, did, I do want to wrap it up, because you've been more than generous with your time, but, I, you know... I wanted to, to know from you, other than that they should all go and buy your book, because that's probably the most important thing a young comic can do. When somebody's starting as a comic, what do you think it's important for them to know as they're walking into this? Well, that's a, well, that's an interesting question. I think that it, it, they, they need to know that it's going to be a miracle if they don't bomb for a while. That's first important, you know, uh, because... Uh, you know, that's probably what's going to happen. You know, and that's that's a that can be very discouraging. You know, the first time I did a hoot night uh, in Greenwich Village, I bombed for five minutes. I was in law school, and I didn't get a laugh for five minutes. And I was back in my law school class the next day because I thought it was over. You know what I mean? I just went. You know, it's over. I don't know what I'm, what to do. You know, and so I don't have a future in this. So for about two weeks, I was thinking like that, and then I realized I hated law school so much that I had to give it another try. <laughs> and that's when I realized I, you know, you have to actually go up there with a plan with your five minutes, starting out. I mean, I can go up without a plan now, but when you're starting out, you definitely have to have a plan. So I started to think about comedy a lot more. I started to get more analytical because I said, I've got to figure out this thing. Uh, so I think bombing, be prepared to bomb till you kind of figure it out. Gary Shandling said he bombed five years before he got laughs. I couldn't have lasted five years <laughs> bombing. You know what I mean? Yeah. I figured myself out fairly soon as to what made me funny because I could not have last the year or two of constantly bombing. I didn't have that kind of temperament. So I think that to expect that, certainly, you know, um, and to realize, you know, you have to learn how to become, how to take your funny that you are with your friends and put it on the stage. That's really the challenge. The challenge is to take your offstage funny and put it on the stage in front of strangers and that's going to take some time you know it is you know even for the most gifted you know you might pick it up a little faster because you might be really natural on on stage but uh i would say try to write honestly try not to be funny as much as try to be interesting and that was a piece of advice which your prior gave me which i thought was very important he said, don't try to be funny, just try to be interesting. And I always felt like that's a, that's a great advice because if you're interested, because even if you're not being that funny, it, you can, if you can interest the audience in what you're saying, you're halfway there. You know, you're halfway there, you know. I'd also say, don't try to go for cheap laughs. Try to be as intelligent, so that's my bias. You, you know, try to treat being a comedian, if you can, as also a very intelligent profession. I tell young comedians, go to school, please. Do not drop on a, go to college. You know, don't quit high, don't graduate high school and try to become a comedian. You won't have anything to talk about. The more knowledge you have, the more your, your comedy will grow. The more information you have, the more your comedy will grow. I had a, a whole routine built on my college experience. I had a whole routine built, uh, you know, whole, almost a whole album. I had a whole album based on my college experience, a whole album based on my um, law school experience. You know what I mean? 
if I hadn't gone to high, college or law school, I wouldn't have, and I, they were great experiences. So I just think that, you know, uh, go get as much information, you know, read as much, experience other art forms as much. All of it can help your comedy. You know, Chris Rock has a high school education, but I worked with him uh, and we did um, three shows and part of Chris's uh, contract is he has three newspapers waiting for him when he gets into each city that he reads through ex completely going out and dating and stuff. No, you got to get old. You've got to be able to really talk about a lot of different things uh, as a comedian, I think. You know? At least that's my approach. You know what I mean? Franklin, this is uh, selfish of me, but I hope to see you on stage again soon. Uh, I, never I never I again. Never again. I'm I, Never again. I'm done. <laughs> Not, e not even a one-time comeback? No. Nope. Oh, people tell me, ask me a lot of times, you know, it's interesting. I get as much fun out of just being funny with my friends now. Right. You know, it's like, because people ask me all the time, like, oh, man, you should get back on stage. And I say, you know, first thing I tell them, I say, you know, there's no easy way to be good. And if I were to do that, I'd have to work hard to be good. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. it's not, you don't just get good. I'd have to work hard. And uh, more importantly, just joking with my friends gives me as much pleasure. I don't need the pleasure of an audience, you know, because I can be funny with my friends when I want to be inadvertently, you know what I mean? Yep. And not have to be. And so I'm, I'm very happy, you know, I got it out of my system. I'm not like Jerry or Jay or, or people that will be doing it. Uh, all right. Well, it, it, but if you do come back, if you change your mind, I want tickets. That's the one thing I'm gonna say. No yeah. worries, no <laughs> worries, no worries. I'm trying to write a book now on a fictional thing and it's kicking my ass, that's what's, but I'm putting all of the, you know, it's interesting. I'm trying to write a book or a story, I don't know what it is. And I, I realized I've been thinking a lot about things going on in the world. And I actually said, you know, if I was still doing stand up, I would probably be talking about these things on the stage but I don't want to do that anymore. So maybe this is the outlet for me because obviously I'm still thinking a lot. You know, it's not like I'm not thinking and, and, and ruminating over a lot of stuff. And I'm thinking, well, maybe I can get out my thoughts in another uh, form. And here's the truth, uh, Jim. I think the world has gotten in such a bad place that for me, it's no longer fun to talk about how bad or crazy the world is. Yeah. I actually remember thinking to myself, the world has become, to me, a parody of itself. How can I parody a parody? You know what I mean? And that's how I, that's, that was something that made me kind of lose some of my interest in doing stand-up, because I would be pointing out the craziness of the world, but I think it's just getting crazier and crazier. And I went, well, you know, I don't really want to do a comment on that anymore. It's just, it's not, it's like shooting fish in a barrel now. So maybe I can get it out in another art form, which hopefully is prose, you know, and I'm struggling with that, to be honest, you know what I mean? But, well, it, but it's intrigued me. If I have no doubt you will figure it out and it's going to be wonderful once you do. Franklin, I want to thank you so much, not only for this interview, but <clears throat> just for, for what you've done all these years, you know, you've, you've given me so much laughter personally you know, listening to your albums, getting to learn from you, the small amount of time we got to spend together in New York when you came here, uh, it's its meant the world to me. And I just wanted to thank you not only for doing this show and, and helping the next generation of comics, but also personally from what I've learned by watching you and what I've learned by talking to you. And I hope we can do this again soon, someday. Sure thing. Okay, so just as I suspected, we did have some technical glitches. I mean, we are recording into the future when we record in Australia. Um, but so many memorable quotes, so much information to digest in today's episode. Um, the, the line that struck me the most is, you know, I, I wanted to be a comedy artist, uh, an artist of stand-up comedy. That is everything. 
Um, I hope you will keep listening to this. Listen to it again and again. This is the kind of episode that can inform you and educate you throughout your career because I'm 30 some odd years into this and I learned something today. Um, we are going to be back with another episode of the Comedy Legacy Series next week. We'll have another amazing guest. Uh, I really do hope that you enjoyed Franklin Ajay as much as I enjoyed Franklin Ajay. Uh, he truly is a, a treasure to our community. Uh, we will see you next time. Goodbye, everybody. Comedy Worldwide Production. Thank you for watching the Comedy Legacy Series. New episodes air every Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern on New Media Comedy TV YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe, and we'll see you next week.